So I'm going to introduce um, Susan to all of you. Susan Still Scott is originally from Pennsylvania, and um, she received her BFA from Tyler School of Art and completed a study abroad program at Temple University in Rome. And then she completed her MFA from Mass Art while living in Massachusetts. And I met Susan before we um, entered our MFA programs because we were doing the circuit searching for the appropriate MFA programs for ourselves. And we ended up being colleagues at that time. And uh, that was in the very late 90s, right? So I couldn't even remember when we... Uh... It was 97. Wow, okay. So it was in the late 90s at that point. And... Um... Oh no, 96, I'm sorry. Well, it must have been 96 to 98. Was that what it was? Yeah, that was us. Yeah. Okay, so that was our MFA years, which are really critical years, and I think for many, many artists. So Susan cu currently lives in New Lebanon, New York, where she makes her home and works in her studio there. She has a studio um, attached to her house, and it's quite beautiful, and um, she lives in a very bucolic <laughs> setting. Yeah. Um, she's exhibited her work extensively from the late 90s till today and has been awarded fellowships at artist residencies such as McDowell Colony, Dorland Mountain Art Colony in California, uh, Yaddo in New York and Vermont Studio Center. And um, in one exhibit, which I did have the privilege of seeing called Corporality and Other Things of Grace and Beauty at Heskin Contemporary in New York, I think Jennifer Riley um, wrote an essay, but um, did she mm -hmm. curate it as well? No, she did not. Okay. So I in, guess you could say I curated it. <laughs> okay. And but just Jennifer Riley is an artist and a curator. And she wrote a, a wonderful essay. And I'm going to just read you one quote to set the stage for the talk that Jennifer Riley wrote about Susan's work. Susan often sounds like a traditional painter at times, explaining, quote, I want these paintings to feel open spatially. But then she betrays her natural impulse to destabilize the received definition of painting when she continues, quote, by using an object to specifically address image, I've concluded that in these works, form is more important than image, unquote. Hmm. Um, no quote again. I'm intrigued by the way image and objecthood speak to each other in a painting as if negotiating roles unquote. She will use canvas, but it may bulge, be torn, stapled, painted, or not painted. She may use a piece of wood to replace the rectangular plane of the painting, leaving it with no formal boundaries, yet sustained as if by an umbilical to the wall. So let's welcome Susan Scott. And um, Susan will invite you to ask questions at any time you feel um, the need to ask a question or the desire to get a little more information. Susan? Yes. Thank welcome. you, Diane. You're welcome. Um, yeah, as we're going through the slides, uh, feel free to ask any questions. I find that's usually a little more spontaneous than waiting till the end. So, you know, feel free to ask any questions. So um, I'm going to begin by showing you one image each of three artists who have had um, a big influence on me and my work for many, many years now. They go back to, well, two of the pieces are from the late 50s, but works that I kind of grew up with seeing. And the third is from 1984, which would have been my undergraduate days. So the slide you're looking at now was, whoops. We missed it. Okay. Very sensitive. That was an entrance to a show. I just put that up there for purposes of introduction. So this first slide is Lee Bontecu. She is um, probably one of the first artists that I saw at MoMA when I was, oh God, early high school. And this painting had such a profound effect on me, although I never really knew it would stick with me the way it did. Um, it's viscerality. It's very physical. It's very large and heavy. It's physically, it's only about 
five by five foot square and it extends from the wall by about 18 inches which is why I showed you a three-quarter view here so you could get a sense of how that thing comes out at you like a a big eyeball um so I came across this painting in MoMA and it just you know, hit me in the gut um and I'm not even sure I liked it it kind of gave me the creeps um, it has very animated quality about the way it's moving out from the picture plane into a sculptural realm. And uh, I had to contend with this for a few minutes before I could uh, move on. But now, years and years later, I see the influence of this work. I mean, it held me there for a reason, even though I didn't necessarily like it at the time. So each of these artists I'm going to show you um, each work with um, various notions of pictorial space, and that by that I mean the space within a picture. Um, you're all familiar with like Renaissance deep space um, and the idea of like the picture frame being a window that you look into. Well, there's all levels of different pictorial space that have been explored through modernism, and that probably is the most um, important and um, uh, continuous idea in all of my work. So I'm working with pictorial space and with actual space, and that's what each of these three artists do. Second one is Richard Tuttle. You're probably familiar with him. Um, this is styrofoam and wood rests on the floor and leans against the wall. Um, this was done 1995 to 2010 over the course of 15 years, which I doubt it took him 15 years to make this, but I think by that it means that this is something he revisited over time. And um, I can relate to that a lot. I recycle a lot of my work. Um, one, for practical purposes. If it's still in the studio, it's taking up space, so it's really not safe from being recycled. Um, but also, it speaks to um, the length of time that a piece of work can evolve. Um, we tend to think of projects as something you sit down and do, you finish it and you walk away. And I find that in my studio, it doesn't happen that way. Um, there's often 10 to 15 projects going on at once, and I kind of wander between them. And they do involve evolve in ways that I, you know, would not have anticipated. Um, Tuttle has no really typical work. He's very experimental. Um, what I respond to is his use of common materials, um, working with what's in hand, almost in the way that, say, folk artists do. There's that level of um, casualness. And also, and maybe it's because of the speed of the work. Um, they're very slow, like you need to spend time with them. And in that sense, there's a, a subtle spiritual presence to what he does. Um, it's not overt. He doesn't really address that verbally about his work. Um, but they're very po poetic. And he's kind of he's kind of been described as, as shaman-like sort of uh, explorer with materials where he's looking for a deeper meaning and um, it's not so much precious materials as any material will do. So the third artist is Elizabeth Murray. She's a powerhouse. Um, this is 1984. Um, this is oil on constructed panels um, I believe this one in particular is stretched canvas over shaped stretchers. Um, sometimes she uses pre-constructed wooden um, stretchers that she has somebody else make for her. But um, what is so direct and powerful about her work is the melding of two-dimensional images right on top of a three-dimensional shape. So it... To me, this is probably one of the most literal melding of two-dimensional two art and a 3D form. And she does it beautifully through movement 
and balance in the piece. The way, if you look at the, the design of the painting, it moves you all around the shape in a way that complements that form. They're wildly energetic, they're quirky, they're irreverent. She'll pretty much do anything, um, which I think is part of the power of the work too, the energy that she puts into it. So next, we're gonna start with my work. And hopefully, you know, you'll, you'll relate to some of the influences in them. Um, I don't have a title for this one, I call it the blue painting. Um, as um, Diane said in her intro in Jennifer's um, essay, my overall concern is form. Um, it wasn't something I decided to do, but it evolved over um, my work in time. I did actually used to make 2D paintings a long time ago. Um, but it's very important how it's painted. Um, and the painting, the way I decide to paint it, responds to the form. And it goes back and forth many times between starting with a form. In this case, it was the block of wood that you can see the canvas is stapled to. And then the painting responds to that shape. And then I may take it off the support and change it again and put it back on a different support. So there's many permutations where form takes over and then when the painting idea comes back. So in that way, it is a literal dialogue back and forth. Um, so let's see. This is turtle shirt. Um, <laughs> you can probably get the idea already that I don't have a specific style in mind. Um, I try not to think in terms of style at all because I think that's a dead end. Um, what you need to do is just keep exploring and the themes that are within you, the themes that interest you are going to continually come out in one way or another. And over the course of time, you'll, you'll see that you'll, the same themes will come up in your work and you'll know that's, that's your direction. That's the place you need to explore. Um, it's not quite that simple. Sometimes it's not obvious, but over time you do begin to see them. Um, I also can't emphasize enough the importance of art history. Um, it, it's been essential for me. Um, I did not come from an artistic background at all. Um, my family is very working class and um, not an artistic bone in anybody's body. So I was the kid that could draw and I knew I was needed to go in this direction, but um, I didn't know anything about any art in general. I mean, we had the picture of the clown with the tear hanging in our house. So, um, so when I got to college, um, art history became very important to me simply because I wanted to know why things were good. Um, and why, especially with contemporary art is like what made this material a piece of art. Um, so I found that the, the most important um, feelings that drove me in my work was the feeling of being confused and doubting and just wonder, like, why is that like that? And um, I, art history helped me understand a lot of that. So this is Slider. Slider is um, one of my larger works. Um, this was made out of, I'm trying to remember the process here, started with the stretcher, I think. Aha, do you guys see a pointer? Yep. Okay, so it started with this stretcher um, that actually was a painting at one time. Um, Often I'll start just stretching a regular canvas, um, knowing that I'm not gonna keep it as a two dimensional thing, but just to get um, the process started. Um, so this canvas was not the original one on there. It was added later. And originally this was hanging on the wall. At some point it got so big and heavy, it came off the wall. 
And so I built this platform so that it could stand on its own and then construct it up from there. Um, it is uh, stuffed. The cloth on top is cotton duck, which is the closest thing to canvas really, but you can get it in a color. Um, and the bottom part is traditional canvas painted. And I'm pretty sure the center of this is hollow, but the canvas has enough paint on it that it, it kind of has, it, it's heavy enough to hold its own form now. How would you say, uh, how large is this in person? This is, oh, that's right. I didn't tell you that. This is about three feet high. So if you stood next to it, it comes up maybe to hip level. And um, it's funny, I find that um, in shows that this has been in, people tend to gravitate toward it. Like at an opening, people stand around in groups and there'll always be a group of people standing <laughs> around this piece. So it kind of has a, it has a presence about it that people like to stand next to it. I don't know. Um, and it's, I should tell you the thickness from side to side, which you can't really get an idea of is it's maybe 18 inches across. Um, the widest part being the blue section. And this is Little Slider. Um, this one again was taken from an old canvas, recycled from an old painting, um, which I kind of prefer because you can turn it over and use the back and it already has, you know, a stiffness to it. Um, it it's not so floppy. Um, it has a partial stretcher. I think there's a couple stretcher bars in there, um, giving it this form up here. And um, other than that, it's it's stapled on um, randomly. I'm not trying to make a perfectly stretched canvas. I'm just getting it on there. And it's stitched. There's a couple stitches here forming this gathered area. Um, piece of wood added here, which I was thinking of as a shelf, which kind of you know, brings it a little inch or so into the sculptural realm. And the wire was added last. And that's um, kind of a very uh, quirky thing that just uh, really brings it out into space, almost as if I was um, making a gesture with the line out into the room. So this is a little slider. Um, I think one thing that um, I mentioned about this is the speed at which I work. Um, I try to work very fast. Actually, now that I say that, it's not true. <laughs> I work very fast and then I work very slow. It's either one or another. The fast part is getting the stuff put together. And I don't know if you can if it comes across, I hope it does a sense of urgency in the materials. Like they just they just had to be put together. Um, it wasn't about making it perfect by any means. Um, and then the slow part is looking. I stand back and look and look and look. And I'll go away, work on some other pieces and come back to it and look. And then something quick will happen, like adding that piece of wood at the bottom and then I'll go away. So that's, a, that's kind of my pace in the studio. This is Whoopi Blade. Um, this is about, I'll try to remember to tell you the sizes on these things. This is about, I wanna say about 18 inches maybe from top to bottom, maybe about 13 across. And this, the base section is about maybe five inches deep. And what it is, it's a panel, a wooden panel with polyester fluff wrapped around it to make it very pillow-like. Um, and then canvas, actually this is linen, stretched over that. And it's very fine linen. So it kind of, when I primed it with rabbit skin glue, um, it kind of took, took that form where it, it shaped around the fluff and kind of uh, gives you the idea that you don't 
you don't really know what's under there. And that's one thing I do really like about my work is that sometimes it's obvious how it's being supported and sometimes you're just not quite sure what's underneath. The paint is flash and acrylic. Um, the white parts was an acrylic wash, so it's several thin layers. Um, the flash is the green paint. And I don't know if you're familiar with flash. Um, it's really a wonderful paint. It's um, vinyl based as opposed to acrylic, which is plastic based. Um, it's water based as well. Um, but it's a, it's a really tough and color fast paint, but it gives you this very super velvety matte surface with no brush mark showing. And I love that because it really accentuates the surface. It's also um, a really nice contrast to other paints like oil or acrylic because each of those paints reflects light differently. So you can play those qualities off each other as well as, you know, besides just color, you can play off um, the glossiness, the matteness, the opaqueness, the, um, and also just, just the way the light reflects off the surface. Susan, I have a quick question. Certainly, yeah. Um, I'm wondering, do you uh, do you have like uh, any specific connection or reason as to why you enjoy like building your paintings far off the wall rather than just like a piece appearing as like an object on the wall? Because I'm, you know, I've seen like I've seen your work like previously, and like you tend to like build really off the wall, and I'm wondering like what's your personal like connection to that? Um, I'm or thinking. it's just like, yeah, or it's just like an interest. Oh, it's definitely an interest. And I think that's how pieces, um, some pieces actually end up on the floor <laughs> because they come off the wall so much that finally gets to the point where it just makes more sense to put it on the floor. Right. Um, there is, I do want them to come out into space. And what is that impulse? It is... I have a theory, and this is just my own theory, so take it as you will, um, about painters and sculptors. Um, the difference being, whereas um, painters to me seem to be more the type that stand back and look at something um, uh, and with more of a detachment because mm -hmm. traditionally the space is within the painting, within the frames, and you're going into it. So there's a sense of standing back and looking into, there's a little bit of a separation. Whereas right. sculptors, they're, they're in it, they're in the same space, there's more of an interaction and I find them to be a little more open maybe. Now that's my own prejudice, so you know, <laughs> don't, don't write that down or anything, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so it's it's more personally engaging. Um, yeah. And, yeah, I, I guess that's the best way I can explain it. No, that's a great answer. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, so this is Teach a Man to Fish. And originally began as three pieces. Um, and during the course of looking at it, um, it I, I realized they just look better together. Um, often when I'm constructing these things, I'll get um, just like a blank feeling from a piece. Like, okay, it's there, it's made, it's, it's kind of interesting, but it just feels kind of blank to me. Like, it's not quite speaking yet. And um, so this seemed to come together when I put them together and I think the reason being is because it brought more negative space into play. So let me describe each panel is maybe a half an inch thick and maybe about five inches deep. And they all hang from the same nail behind it up around here. Um, there's just a little wire that connects them and then it hangs on a nail. Um, so it brings into play, there's a negative space that goes from here to here to here. Ah, 
I touched the wrong thing. But anyway, it's um, the negative space that I think pulled that together. Also, um, just one more thing to say about that is I often hang it different ways. Um, sometimes it's in a corner, which kind of closes it up more accordion style. Um, that is what you saw in the slide is a flat surface. So it's a little more relaxed. This one doesn't have a title either. Sometimes it just doesn't come to me. Um, so I call this the wrapped blue wrapped painting. Um, I have other slides of this, but I chose this slide so that you could kind of see in from the top a little bit and get a sense of how it's put together. Um, what I what I like about this one and what often turns up in my work is a contrast between strength and fragility. And you know, it's obvious which side is which. Um, what it was, was um, the remnants of a, an old canvas. Um, I painted many more layers of acrylic on it. So it's very thick and wrapped it around a block of wood and wrapped it as far as it would go and then continued it with this very, um, it's a very lightweight linen. And I left the fold marks in it. And as it droops over time, it changes the shape of the linen a little bit. But um, I wanted it to be very simple, but they, they never are with me. There are, there's always a lot more going on from, you know, this, uh, oh, I gotta stop doing that the bumpy edges to the thickness of the wrapped canvas. There's, they're very slow in that the more time you spend with it, the more the details become apparent. So this one is called Redo. And that's because it's, it's severely recycled from other parts of other paintings. Um, what it is, is the lower section, um, is painting parts assembled kind of collage style. And then the upper part is um, Luan, um, which is like a, a birch veneer. So it's very, very thin. And what I love about it is it gives you the, sol the solid look of wood, but it's thin enough that you can cut it with scissors. So it's like a heavy paper in that way. And again, it just allows me to work very fast and very um, intuitive, even impulsive. Um, and I do that because I can surprise myself that way. And it's not always good. Lots of times I throw it out or just keep working and change it again. Um, but I do find that things happen that I end up being very happy with. So this is called Painting for Later. Um, I have a second slide of it. I'll describe, I'll explain the name in that one. But um, this is a small piece. It's about the size of your hand if you had an oven mitt on it. Um, in this, this case, I have it hanging on the wall. I've shown it several different ways. I've shown it on the floor. I've shown it um, in the corner with uh, a shelf. Um, and each way it has a different meaning. And I like to play with that meaning. Uh, not all the pieces lend themselves to that, but some do. And when they do, I'm very interested in how they engage the space around themselves. And that's a very sculptural idea. So here's the other slide of it. Um, the shelf down here is just a piece of plywood. It is part of the piece and the space between the two is an important part of the piece. It's, it's a very deliberate space. It's mounted on one wall and kind of curving toward the brown wall. Um, the fact that the walls are two different colors is part of it too. Um, I did that intentionally almost to just make it obvious that um, it was going from one space toward another. So that's the reason for the name of the painting. Painting for later, I was thinking how, um, you know, in politics, when something can't be agreed upon, they put it on the shelf and they'll deal with it later. So that's kind of where the, the shelf kind of 
influence the name. Uh, Susan, I wanted to know, yeah. how do you um, ch choose your colors? Um, that's a really good question. I, I struggle with that um, in that I find that I can easily um, keep reverting to the same palette. Um, and I think that that is happening maybe because the form has become so strong uh, as opposed to the pic pictorial part. Um, so I, I try very, very, very hard to be aware of like not picking the same colors all the time. Um, although, you know, <laughs> you might see that there is some similarity. Um, more recently, I'm, I'm getting a lot more aggressive with um, color relationships. But um, yeah, does that answer it? Yeah, yeah, it definitely does. <laughs> okay, okay, perfect. Yeah, I mean, you know, you we have our bag of tricks, right? And it's it's important to catch yourself when you're going back to the same old thing. Um, I mean, because colors, color has its own meaning, as I know you all know. Um, so, like, say for example, in a piece like this. Um, which I call folded painting. Um, the they're all cool colors, and I wanted to keep them in the cool realm um, as a way not not to be monochromatic, but to be in the same, you know, a less push and pull between warm and cool colors. In other words, um, keeping it to the surface more. Um, the green is a darker value. And my thinking there, I think, was to try to almost as a visual strap, strap the two sides of the painting, of the painting, sculpture, whatever, together. Um, so it's just like a, a visual tie. Um, but again, you know, don't think too much about that. It, it, I don't mean it to be literal. Um, this so started that, out. Can I, can I ask you a, a little question to address? Yeah. Do you think that um, there's a little bit of a hierarchy here and that the form becomes more important and that color, while it's important, um, serves for you in, in many cases a, a kind of a gelling of the form or a support for the form rather than existing totally um, as an expression of color? Exactly. Um... I try very hard to, or the way I think about it is integrating the color with the form. Um, you're right about this. I mean, it, it's a very deliberate statement towards sculpture in that I put it, actually gave it its own little pedestal to stand on. Um, and so it's completely in the round. Um, what you're seeing, you probably know, are, are both sides of it, two sides. Um, and yeah, Diane, the, as I work, my painting decisions are based on the form. And, and again, as I work, the form can then respond to the painting and then the painting to the form. Um, in the end, I try to have them pretty, pretty simple looking, um, but sometimes you'll see they end up being very thick and very worked. And that just means that it, it took a lot more to actually pull the two together. Makes sense. Okay. So this is called Saddle Sore. It, again, it's completely in the sculptural round. And I guess even that's kind of reinforced with the piece of glass that it stands on. Um, I don't know why, but that piece of glass seemed to make a difference. Um, I had been working on the piece and I put it on my pallet table, which is a large table with plate glass on it. And um, I set it down on that and um, the glass just really worked with it. So I, I had to get a piece made cut to size for it. Um, but this is basically another folded painting um, that flops over the piece of wood that is its support. The can, the painted, section itself is hollow. Um, 
it again it was recycled painting um folded and then folded over this piece of wood and and painted accordingly um actually what you see on the other is leftovers from the old painting so in in some cases the old marks stay um this is another um very sculptural piece. I still think of them as painting in a way, though. Um, mostly because I, I really don't want to think of it one way or another. So I'm I'm always like really interesting, interested on how paint is going to get on this object and what may already be there and how to work with it and then how to make the form its own, how the paint will make the form its own. So this is called Junie, which after actually is a nickname of somebody I know. Um, it's uh, freestanding. It's the canvas is attached to like a circular base. And then it's there's a polyester stuffing inside to keep it kind of in this form. You can see it's it's stuffed pretty tight if you look at that side. And then it has casters on the bottom. So it actually can be wheeled around, but not too well because this caster is uh, wrapped up in a ball of string and painted. Um, so it looks like it should move easily, but it doesn't. It's got a bum leg. So, um, you know, I guess in that way, I do think of them as body parts sometimes. And, and that's, that's really a, a classical sculpture uh, attitude, way of looking at things. This is fish head. Um, this is another one that uh, is attached to a, a circular base. This one began on the floor, ended up on the wall. So this one went the other direction. Um, and over here to the right, it just gives you um, two different views in space. The back is painted differently than the front. Um, this when it was on the floor i think it was just too short you know it's, it's about maybe 14 inches out from the wall and i guess i just felt like it was too small to um really be taken seriously on the floor like it was hard to engage with it so i put it up at eye level or sometimes it's even hung a little higher than eye level um i call it fish head because it reminds me of like a hunting trophy um, you know, people will put a bear head or a deer head or a fish on a plaque on the, on the wall. So, and I, it also kind of made me think that, you know, sometimes paintings are this object you're proud of and you put it up on the wall, like as a sort of trophy. So that's fish head. Susan. Um, yeah. I have a question about how do you what is the thought process going behind titles because i mean it's the paintings <laughs> like that where you know it seems very you know like when i saw that on your website i really was like oh yeah like it kind of reminds me of like a fish head like what you said and you know but then i think of something like your other piece like teach a man to fish or like slider and little slider what are your what is your like influence when you think of titles mm. are they personal or are they just kind of you know, strut up together, last minute kind of thing? What what goes through your head? Well, they're both. Um, sometimes it may be personal, but it's not that important that anybody else knows. Um, right. it, it's, it's pure free association. Um, I, do, I do spend a lot of time with each piece. So after a while, I find myself just referring to a piece a certain way in my own head. Um, right. So sometimes they pop right out, like fish head just popped right out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> literal. <laughs> See, I did respond to it. Um, and other ones, I, I I have to make it up, and it it's it's a right. little hard to land on it. And then you know, as you saw, some of them I don't name at all because they just nothing has really stuck to it. So I guess the real test is if I uh, 
try to refer to a painting months later and I still don't know which one I'm talking about, then then that's the wrong name. Right. So this one is Long Boy. And it's basically a, oh my God, how did I do that? Well done. Close your eyes. Ah, there we go. Okay. Long Boy. Um, you know, the, the source of the title is kind of obvious. Um, but it's interesting. Again, I guess, boy, it's like I'm giving it a personification. Um, I wanted to make um, a painting that was far outside of traditional dimensions. And so I thought of um, what if you just had one stretcher bar um, to use to make a painting. Um, so this, this is basically just a board, it's six feet. Um, I didn't cut it, it's the size, you know, you can buy them at Home Depot and um, began to make a painting on it. And then you begin to think, well, how is the canvas gonna relate to this? And then given the dimensions of the, the board, how thick is the paint gonna be? How thin is it gonna be? How far is the canvas gonna stretch? All those kind of questions. Um, what else needs to be here or what doesn't need to be here and can relate? Um, so those kind of questions go through my head. And also, um, I guess in sort of a surrealistic type of way, I do just kind of try to stay in a quiet place so that my subconscious impulses can come out. Um, so I really, really, if something feels predetermined, I try not to do it because I just find those are the least interesting things I have made were ideas that I thought of ahead of time and then just executed. It's always more interesting if I don't know where I'm going. So, oh, also this one as well, um, I guess with the more three-dimensional pieces, um, I do install them different ways again. Um, this one has been hung from the ceiling. Um, it's been hung on the wall. And in this case, it's leaning against the wall. I think I like this one the best. This one is Operation Blank. Um, and that title refers to kind of, you know, when there's um, military operations it'll be operation something some kind of a pompous name um so i left it blank because i thought this is something tactical this is an operation this piece and even in the sense of a physical like a surgical operation um you can see that relationship but blank meaning it's open-ended it, it can be more than one thing so this was a piece I really struggled with. And again, as I said, back with the, the independent pieces of uh, Teach a Man to Fish, this felt, it got to a point where it felt kind of blank. It was not cut open. It was pretty much the solid shape that you see here. And I got very frustrated with it. And uh, it was an aggravating day. And so finally I just took the knife to it. And, um, you know, often that is some, it definitely changes the piece drastically and sends it off into a different direction. In this case, it exposed the uh, support, which, you know, turned out to be interesting because it's, a, this is a found object. It's basically a little wooden frame with a turnbuckle in the middle. Um, so it kind of gives it a little more, uh, I don't want to say sinister. I don't think any of my work is sinister, but you know that feeling I had in my gut that day. And um, this is about maybe 12 inches high, maybe about eight or nine across, and maybe about two and a half to three inches out from the wall. This is resting spot. Um, this is a pretty, a very recent piece. Um, actually, I think the remaining slides, yeah, are all new pieces made in the last year. Um, 
So this is called Resting Spot. It's a smaller piece. It's about maybe, I don't know, 11 inches high and maybe uh, the base part is probably five inches. And then this is a piece of flat canvas uh, tacked to the back um, as a projection off the main piece. So this one um, is spare on the paint. Um, I wanted to emphasize the fabrics and the textures and colors of the different fabrics. So here, this is cotton duck. There is, this is traditional painting canvas. And this, most of it is this pale blue velvet um, that I then painted back to look like the canvas. Um, and I didn't feel that it, it needed a lot of um, mark making on it, but I put a little bit to emphasize the direction um, and just the intuitive construction kind of feelings, like the way this, the placement and thickness of this kind of continues this line. And over here, this brown section just kind of continues the line around. So, um, yeah, I guess for me, it's just a way of visually making it cohesive. And um, I don't know, that just got tacked on in the end and it seemed to make a lot of sense to me. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say about that. This one, um, I gave you three views because it it is important like to, to look at these from different sides. And I, I definitely take that into account when I'm working on them. Um, and they change a lot from different sides. Like here, it's very spare. This is a very frontal formal view where I'm really thinking of it as a painting. And then over here, you've got the canvas with a softer feel and you know you have these lines that aren't following the form of the canvas they're doing their own thing so in that sense in in the broadest um way of thinking about pictorial design um these are drawing decisions and the thickness and placement of this thick paint at the top i think of them as drawing or painting decisions um so that's my realm. It's kind of a minimalist realm of thinking about the picture plane, but I am definitely um, referring to that in these pieces and some more directly than others. The ones that have this, the rectangular format tend to be the ones that I'm really addressing painting. So this was another one. Um, it was an older, older piece, but it just never really arrived to a point where I liked it. Um, so after uh, years of looking at it, I cut it in half and pretty much um, just exposed the wood on this, this side. And I, the wood was not painted yet. Um, it was just a plain, you know, blonde wood color. Um, but the nakedness of that piece of wood and just the simplicity of the form um seemed very vulnerable to me and even seemed like like it was naked and to me that just kind of um uh, finished it off for me and but i did feel it needed some color but i didn't want to lose the quality of the wood by covering it up so this is really just a stain it's a um casein paint which is um I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's a very thin, watery, milk-based paint. Um, and it, it produces beautiful washes. You can thin it down very, very, very thin, but it'll still give you intense color. Okay. This one, right now I'm calling it pocket, but I'm, we'll see if that sticks. Um, Susan, uh, mm -hmm. we have a chat question from Lily. Uh, what's the name of the paint? Oh, casein, the one I just spoke about. Mm -hmm. It's spelled C-A-S-E-I-N. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so pocket. Um, this one um, was a little bit of a surprise. I had uh, basically some sheets of leftover canvas, rectangulars, so I sewed them together, turned them inside out, made like an envelope type sleeve. Um, I really liked the shape and the softness of the form, but I didn't know what to do with it for a long while. Um, this went through many stages of me like painting shapes on it, doing compositions, thinking how I wanted to break up this plane. And really it didn't work at all. Um, there was, you know, they might've been nice compositions, but there was no reason for them to be on this pocket shaped piece. They just weren't uh, speaking together. So I ended up going back to a solid color and I, you know, the, uh, Obviously, what that does is it unifies the entire piece so that the form begins to speak louder. Um, this little slice had been there originally. Um, there was the, the original piece of canvas had been cut. So that slice was there. And I thought, well, I'm going to try to find a way to work with it. And um, again, I just tried doing different things with it and that. And, finally stuck a piece of wood in there as though, um, I guess you could say it's referencing the support of painting, but I hate to think that literally. Um, and then mounted it on another piece so it wouldn't be squished against the wall. I wanted the softness of this cloth form to show. And then um, just finished it up accordingly. And this is my last image. Um, it's called Away. And I think because this is back at um, a two-dimensional painting, for the most part, all except for this stick that's attached to the left side. Um, but recently, uh, mostly since lockdown, and I've had so much time in the studio, I've been re-examining um, ways in which I can paint things um, and how I can bring kind of broaden the pictorial language and bring that back into my three-dimensional work. So I have a lot of panels I've been working on. Uh, this is maybe nine by 12, the panel itself, and then the piece of wood adds a little length to it. Um, but yeah, I was looking for a sense of open space on a little panel um, in a way that kind of suggests the openness of the space around a more 3D object. Um, so that's why I call it away. I feel like I'm very far away from whatever I'm looking at. Um, but other than that, um, I don't know, I find the, the imagery interesting and it operates a little bit more on its own as opposed to reinforcing the structure. So I think going forward, I would like to incorporate more of the, um, the image mark making and with the structure, the reinforcing the structure of the piece. So that's kind of my going forward territory and I'm not, not, not sure how it will work out, but um, sometimes I just miss regular painting and, and want to go back and visit it for a while. So, um, so that's where I am today. And um, I guess to finish up, um, mostly I just, I, I just can't emphasize enough. And I know Diane feels the same way of just nothing is more important than exploration and staying open. Um, and learning about your own artistic roots, like what is unique to you. And that is something that just comes out over time. Um, and, you know, either you put your experience, not your life lived experience, but the experience you're having with the materials in front of you, the materials from the moment you're in, into the work. And I think it will come through. Mm -hmm. And, um, Otherwise, you just kind of have a pile of stuff. So, you know, that's the magic is, is taking what is 
really just material that doesn't know what to say and, and making it say something. Um, Susan, we have another question from Lily. Um, are there any materials that you haven't tried that you want to experiment with next? <laughs> well, there's a whole wide world out there. Um, I do tend to stick to uh, materials that you would typically find in a painting studio. Um, and I don't know why I feel I need that anchor. I think once I let go of a certain scent, set of studio materials then i'm out in a realm of uh, sculpture and installation that is a whole nother world that i'm not as interested getting into i i still think of myself as a painter so i feel complete permission to add whatever i want to the piece but i think it will always be in relation to painting because I love it. Um, yeah, I think um, too that um, this course is also taught through the lens of painting uh, mm -hmm. or the training of a painter. And mm -hmm. I think um, there are so many painters who are doing sculpture and so many painters who are doing installation. And then there's that very, what I find very rich territory of the 2D, 3D mix. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it does make a really big difference about how you're trained and what you've been looking at for most of your life. If it's, mm -hmm. if it's through painting, you approach 2D, 3D through that lens in some way and vice mm -hmm. versa. No, I think so. And especially, you know, I, I, I've studied so much art history um, that I can't help but look at it that way. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't show them here because it would have been too long, but um, some of my influences go back to the Middle Ages, um, and most of that was religious painting, just given to the uh, the times that we were living in. But um, they were also meant to be instructive, because most of the population was illiterate at that time. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a lot of meaning in every composition, in colors, in, you know... Um, the site specificity of it, like where it was shown um, in the church, if it was in the front, if it was up above you, if it was to the side, if it had a consecutive order. I, I find all that really interesting. Um, uh, number one, just because it is kind of how the Western mind works. Um, we're looking for meaning. We're wired that way. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, you can find that all through history. You can find that in cave painting. Absolutely. I think, you know, it's just in our DNA as humans um, yeah. to make yeah. meaning and to make marks and to make tools and, you know, all of that. Continue your exploration, students. And um, thank you again, Susan. And we'll be um, closing out now. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. you too. Bye.